Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the M3 Market Update. My name is Melody Wright, and I do this show to try to give you context about all the news that you're hearing about housing, commercial real estate, and mortgage finance. Um, these these things come together to make up anywhere between 12 and 20 percent of our GDP. In many ways, people think that housing drives the economy. Um, and I tend to agree. There's just so much activity around it, so much consumption, um, something I definitely saw out on the road. For some of you that don't know me, I track about 75 cities now across the country looking at different listings for sale, listings for rent, short-term rental listings, looking at all housing stock because so many of the housing analysts out there look at just one component of the housing market. And <clears throat> that's why they're always surprised <laughs> uh, if you go back over time and look at many of the housing analysts and economists in this space, they have been notoriously wrong and incorrect. Um, my goal here is not to be right or wrong. It's just to tell you what's going on and tell you the path that I see ahead based on the experience I had in the GFC and all my time in mortgage and housing and in the last three years that I spent really diving into macro, trying to understand the drivers outside of the United States and sort of within our global economy that, that could impact how housing, uh, you know, how home prices, whether or not it's a good time to buy or sell, whether you're an investor or you're just looking for shelter. So um, thank you for joining I did a breaking news segment last week on uh, several news stories that were going on out there that mainstream media was not covering. I'm going to quickly touch on that again today. There was one story I didn't cover in the breaking news, which was Fannie Mae's decision um, for those that uh, in their multifamily space that you have to do a pre-review before you can deliver that loan to Fannie Mae. Now, this is a really big deal. <clears throat> Uh, well, you're thinking, well, that's fine. They were going to follow the guidelines anyway. No big deal. It's the amount of time. It's disrupting the machine. So in this space uh, of buying and selling loans, whether they be, you know, single family mortgage loans, whether they be a mortgage on a multifamily property, the people that play in this space um, get addicted to what I call gain on sale. And that's that bump that they get when they sell these to the GSCs, the agencies, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, Ginnie Mae, and they just sort of keep pumping that stuff up. I'll give you a funny quick story from the GFC. I remember a lot of Bank of America folks <clears throat> that would come to, that came to uh, GMAC uh, to help us. Uh, that didn't work out so well, but you know, they would tell me stories about when they were getting ready to announce results, they'd see net income was coming a little lower. I think I mentioned this on my the special and nobody special. Uh, and, and essentially, they'd be like, all right, let's cook up some securitizations. Let's let's go find some loans. Let's put them in a securitization. Let's sell it. That's how we're going to beef up that in, net income. And so no matter what, everyone gets addicted to that quick hit to their income statement because it really can paper over so many problems. And if you can just keep the engine going, this is the idea. You can extend, pretend, just keep it going a little longer. Keep the music playing a little longer. Um, unfortunately, though, with Fannie Mae doing what it's doing, it's going to slow everything down. This is going to start to choke the capital markets um, as well as what we saw with Freddie Mac, uh, telling Meridian Capital that they had to cease and desist origination. That's a big player. Their seventh largest originator for the past seven years in the multifamily space. They're saying, hold, stop. <clears throat> and so it's not just that company. I think that's what so many people fail to realize is that that company is going to turn around and they're going to have counterparties that are going to be impacted. And so everything that happened last week sort of sets the stage for um, distress in the capital markets. Now, in the Substack this week, I say, you know, this isn't the end of the world, but it's something to be, be paying attention to because it could very well start something like a credit event when one of these very large players turns around, <clears throat> they can't pay their counterparties, those counterparties can't then pay their counterparties, and everybody's like scrambling for liquidity, for cash, because guys... 
<clears throat> we don't you <laughs> things don't work the way they used how many of us used to think and and you know this everything that is done out there today is done off debt and borrowings and cheap borrow and cheap borrowings and you know something I think I talked about but I can't remember it was a crazy week last week is that Mr. Cooper, um, that large originator and servicer that had a data breach that I talked about last week, they have a lot of their lines of cre credit coming due. Now, I've I've had a few people out there, not not a ton, but you know enough, that told me I'm being crazy about Mr. Cooper, that this is no big deal, they're going to be fine. And if you look at their stock price, that's certainly what the street thinks. Um, but, you know, yesterday, another breaking news, uh, there's class action lawsuits being filed against them for the cyber attack. I don't understand why people don't understand <laughs> why this is such a big deal. Um, it, it really is. And mainly, you know, maybe it's because people don't understand how strictly regulated mortgage is. You know, I think people still think that the banks are who originate mortgages. That's not true. It's the non-banks. Um, and because this is 95% a government mortgage market, there's all kinds of crazy things that go on. Like, for instance, you don't get to choose your mortgage servicer. So sure, you choose who uh, you take that loan out with, but they turn around and sell it into the secondary market like right away. And then wherever that lands, you have no choice in that. That's why there's such thing as the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau because if you're unhappy with service, you can't just get up and walk away. And so these are highly regulated. And I think that Wall Street doesn't understand how much, how much government bureaucracy is really involved in this process. And then what it looks like when the process starts to slow down. Um, so there's a lot going on. Uh, you know, that, that lawsuit against Mr. Cooper is just going to be the first of many problems for them. We have no idea how many people have been impacted by this data breach. Um, you know, they were in, they actually sued their payment um, provider because uh, of an incident where that payment provider did something really stupid, which was test with live data. You don't do that. Big no-no. And, it, 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 and, and basically what ended up is uh, they were taking payments out of people's accounts that were not authorized. So, so think you paid your mortgage payment through this um, payment vendor. Uh, they accidentally the next night decided to draw it again. Now, that that's a huge, most people's largest bill is their mortgage payment. So you can imagine how impactful that was. And so, you know, Mr. Cooper sued them. Uh, the CFPB gave them a fine of $25 million. I mean, you know, and, and then also there's there's borrower um, reparations that have to be done. So this is this is just the beginning of trouble for Mr. Cooper. And I guarantee you, you know, this breaches so many of the triggers and covenants in their contracts with their counterparties that they are they're going to be meeting with a regulator, a counterparty, an unhappy borrower and an attorney's you know, nonstop for the foreseeable future. So for anybody out there that thinks this is a non-event, um, <clears throat> it's not. It may take some time to play out and for you guys to see the, the implications. But th Mr. Cooper, is the, their business depends on the government. I just want you guys to understand that. Okay, so think about when you go and you get a driver's license or anytime you interact with our government, you know, you think about... So the idea that these guys are really private actors is kind of, you know, funny in and of itself. Okay, so I am headed out to Denver today. I actually have to get on a plane here very shortly. So this is going to be short and sweet today. I'll be doing a site visit out there. We heard from um, New Build Guru, who, which is a uh, Twitter account that I follow. He is in new home sales. He's always got great intelligence. And he's saying that, you know, th they're having a really tough time, even with all these incentives out there uh, to get people to get traffic in uh, to these new build sites. You know, they're even giving the realtors like increased fees. It's still not doing enough. So I'll be going out to Denver, doing some site visits of some new build sites out there, talking to some people just to see what I can see. But, you know, Denver has, in my opinion, kind of been in a bubble for a very long time. And it started with, you know, tech really growing out there and everybody just thinking everybody was coming to Denver. But the, the biggest problem is that, you know, wages just weren't keeping up. 
And although there was this great, you know, idea of a tech hub, there just wasn't enough of other industry around. Um, everyone I knew when I lived in Denver, I lived there four years, was working another job, two jobs, because it was just so expensive to live there. I often joke that <clears throat> I spent more time doing fun things in Denver when I didn't live there uh, because it was more inexpensive than when you did live there just because the cost of living was so high. So I'm going to go out there and see what I see. Um, while I'm out there, I'll be paying attention, trying to keep abreast of these news stories um, because, you know, this is how these times go. If you weren't around last time or for other cycles, is that you have a, a, a very crazy week last week where it seems like everything's breaking, everything's going wrong. World's biggest bank is having to, you know, trade on a USB stick. Um, and then you'll have a week of relative quiet and sometimes even months. So, but it's important that we stay paying attention um, because these things can turn quickly. Uh, and if you're in the middle of making a decision, then, you know, it's important to really know what's actually going on. So, um, okay, I'm going to just go through the listings today. Some interesting, actually, side notes. Um, but what I am seeing, you know, the Fed saw that inventory rose month over month by 5%. You know, that's a pretty good pace and a pretty good chunk. It was still down a little bit year over year, but inventory is definitely increasing. You know, in the cities I track, it was up almost 1% week over week. Again, week over week mo movements. I, the reason I track those is I really just want to know immediately when you start to sense a shift. Um, but to the average, they're actually up 4% to the 18-week average for inventory listings for sale. So I believe, you know, there's certain areas that aren't behaving the same, but then some are really starting to get cooking in terms of those increases of uh, inventory. Where is that? Florida. As we've talked about on this show, uh, Florida is going to be the epicenter again. Uh, you know, <laughs> I thought it might be Texas. I was wrong. I should have known better after, you know, reading Swamp Peddlers and Bubble in the Sun. But, you know, people in Florida woke up last weekend to escrow notices that said that their mortgage payment was increasing, um, sometimes double, and you know because their taxes and insurance, those things are increasing exponentially. Uh, I tweeted out last week, you know, a local news story about um, a, a place I visited, Pembroke Pine Century Village, you know, where they're talking about they're on a fixed income. They got a notice, you know, that they've got an increase of two hundred dollars a month, and you know it. Even if maybe they can stomach that $200, what they can't stomach is that that could happen in another six months. And so they really don't know what the end is as these insurance companies are leaving Florida. And as, you know, the values are so high, they're getting taxed at that assessed value. And so these are sticker shock coming all across Florida, you know, where all these retirees move down there on a promise of more affordable living and what they're waking up to is you know that's not so and so we're definitely seeing in florida florida a lot of uh, increases in listings and i honestly think that probably in the next six weeks the the strike will start to fall uh people are getting desperate enough that you know they're going to have to start making those price reductions and then you're going to see movement in this market and you're going to see prices start to come down you know, because this is the holiday season, uh, people may do their best to wait till after the holidays to really, you know, address this problem. However, what I'm seeing is they're not in many cities. Um, so, you know, stay tuned. Uh, I think that the market is turning. We've had a lot of stops and starts this year, but I, I kind of feel like this is it. Um, you know, again, things could sl slow down, speed up. Um, you know, one thing I'm very curious about is this like minor drop in rates. What impact does that have on, on demand? And will it be enough? What we've seen so far is that actually refi refinance is up, meaning that people are looking at that outstanding credit card debt and, you know, they're being kind of coaxed into okay, if I, you know, take, I consolidate and I do a refi, that interest rate is lower. And the problem is what happens is a lot of people do that. They pay off their credit cards and then they just go back to spending. So, but anyway, even in this high rate environment, we're seeing refinances uh, tick up. So 
Okay, let's just get started with uh, the top cities with largest percent increase in inventory week over week. And this is for November 5th through the 12th. Uh, Cape May was number one. You know, the, I, okay, so fine, small numbers, but guys, the, 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 uh, this is, they're, <laughs> sorry, I'm kind of speechless because the way that listings for sale are increasing there is a little startling for such a small community. And they also um, have increases in the listing for rent. So I think there is, we are starting to see distress. Uh, Rochester, number two at 5.92%. Number three, Johnson City. Very interesting. Again, seeing a lot of new uh, construction come online. They're up 5.45% week over week. Um, and just a reminder, everybody, I'll have the monthly, monthly summary for next week, which you'll be able to get out of the sub stack, which lists all the cities, all these metrics, you know, month over month, year over year. I know, you know, this kind of top 10 list doesn't give you a ton of flair, flavor and context, but a lot of these cities I'm tracking for specific users, ask me or followers to track. So, you know, uh, basically you're kind of listening to hear about your city um, and you can follow along in the Substack. And, you know, when, uh, when I have more time, There'll be nice charts and graphs. But anyway, okay, so Westchester County up at 4%. Uh, so again, this belies the idea that uh, the Northeast is going to be immune. I, I hear that all the time. I, that's simply not accurate. The demographic picture in the Northeast is not good. And so as people leave, you're going to see home prices come down. Um, okay, Rosemary Beach up at 3.45%. You know, they, they keep staying up here. I, I think that Rosemary Beach is going to have some trouble, uh, you know, but when the right price, when it gets to the right price, I think people will absolutely be interested. Uh, and there is still enough uh, capital out there, enough liquidity at the top 20% that I do think, you know, we'll get purchases in some of these more, these, er these uh, kind of leisure and hospitality areas um, because, you know, even in downtimes, people do go on vacation. You know, everything's not going to stop. It's just going to be a lot less people. And, uh, you know, I think really what's probably going to suffer the most is luxury, uh, believe it or not. Okay, Topsy's large percent increase in inventory compared to the 18-week average. Okay, so instead of a week over week, this is the 18-week average. So number one is Bakersfield, and this been this one's been weird. It could just be some sort of data issue with a listing site. I use Realtor.com, uh, but something definitely up there. Thirty five point five four percent. Number two is Palm Springs, up at twenty point one two percent. Number three, Cape May, up at eighteen point seven eight percent to their average. Again, this is the, you know that's what we're seeing. Fort La Lauderdale, this is a big one, thirteen point four three percent to their average. 13.43% to their average. You know, we've only seen those kind of numbers in these tiny little beach towns um, the, the, and in California and Austin, don't get me wrong. But, you know, for Fort Lauderdale, this is a big deal. And this is this is bearing out in what I'm seeing everywhere. Sedona at 11.69% um, in, you know, increase compared to their average. Okay, so Top City's largest... Um, percent increase in inventory uh, from the start. So I started tracking this in January. So guess what? In a couple of months, we're going to have a year for a lot of these cities. I'm very excited about that. Um, you know, it, I just could not rely on the existing data out there and wanted to get more real time, which meant that, you know, I didn't have historical time series for some of these um, cities that don't get tracked the same way. Okay, so number one, San Ramon, they're back up from number two at 108%, and this is increase in listings for sale since the start, and that was January of 23. Uh, number two, San Francisco at 91.43%. Uh, number three, Bakersfield at 83.33%. They've never been this high up on the list, and here they are. Number four, Denver, 61.03%, uh, and up from number five last week. And so this is exciting. I'm going to go out and see what's happening in real time. Number five, Coeur d'Alene. Uh, they are at 60.88%, down from number four. Number six is uh, Se Seattle at 53.35%. Number seven is San Jose at 51.11%. Number eight uh, is back in the top 10. 
Uh, this is their first time, I actually believe, and they are at 46.94% um, increase in listings for sale since the start. Galveston at 45.83% and Austin at 44.02%. So Austin came back in and kicked Boston out of the top 10. Uh, so, okay, top cities with the highest percent increase in single family listings week over week, November 5th through the 12th. Uh, San Francisco, this is interesting because uh, we saw this week in San Francisco listings for sale go down, uh, but this is a big jump in listings for rent, meaning maybe people don't want to, it's been sitting too long and they really are just going to do whatever they have to do to try to get some cash flow. Uh, Brattleboro up at 15.38%, Cape May up at 14.29%. So we've got both listings for rent and listings for sale going up in Cape May. Uh, Wexford County up at 12.5% and Rosemary Beach up at 7.69%. Okay, and so top cities with highest percent decrease of, um, I'm sorry, increase of single family rental listings to 18 week average. Uh, okay, so number one, Cape May at 90.48% of, <laughs> so that's huge. Again, small numbers, but huge. Rosemary Beach at 67%, Sevierville at 46.63%, Dallas at 38%, um, So and listings for sale and rent both went up, and San Francisco at 31.93%. Again, this is single-family re rental listings to the 18-week average. Okay, um, so now top cities with the highest percent decrease of single-family um, re rental listings to average. So this is the decrease. This is the city's that this week showed a decrease compared to their average. So number one is Tampa, 27.4%. Uh, number two is Orlando at down 22.66%. I have a hunch uh, that in Tampa and Orlando, things are actually moving to list for sale, but we'll see. Bozeman down at 13.65%. Boston down 11.83%. And Wexford County down 11% to their average. They were actually up week over week, but to their average, they were down. This is, you know, an 18-week average. Again, that's kind of a smaller community, uh, so, you know, small moves can make a difference. Okay, so this is very interesting. So uh, short-term rental. You know, I have a, I, I combine different data sources, and one thing that I do is I look at these cities every week at short-term rental average daily rates. Um, I pick a weekend two weeks in the future and I look at that and look at the average daily rate. Well, guess what happened this week? Airbnb took off uh, that filter, that ability to see what an average rate was for all the properties listed in that area. You know, this site, you would think they would start to try and increase functionality, <laughs> and, but no, they're, they're taking away um, the ability for people to really understand what true pricing might be in these areas. Instead, you have to go look at all these listings, listings whereas before they would give you that average daily rate. So we're going to lose out on our week over week until I get daily scra scraping done, uh, which, you know, that's in the works right now. A uh, big project, though, to scrape all these sites every single day. So, you know, not exactly sure when I'm going to have it, but probably in the next 60 days. So stay tuned for that. But we will have month over month and year over year. Um, I'll just quickly, you know, the, go over the listings from last week. Uh, you know, average daily rates were down on average last week about 4%. Um, and so these are all compared to the 16-week average uh, for week over week. But Rosemary Beach down 55.65%. Destin down 45.37%. Chicago down 39.16%. San Francisco down 32.89%. And Portsmouth down 31.94%. And I should have all of the updated short-term rental listing for October. Um, and I think finally we'll have the occupancy as well. So to really give a good analysis next week in the monthly summary. Um, for commercial real estate, you know, the biggest thing, there was an auction, well, there was um, a fire sale kind of last week on the Signature Bank Act assets. Uh, everyone is kind of looking toward this, trying to see if we're going to get true discovery um, price discovery on a lot of these properties. What does price discovery mean? That means that um, essentially you have a comparable, okay? So 
let's say, you know, I'm in New York City and, uh, you know, the last building of my size kind of, you know, sold for this crazy amount of 20 million. So everyone around that has a building just like mine thinks they're going to get 20 million. Well, because the markets have been frozen because you have kind of a buyer and seller strike, um, this kind of forced sell of assets could create different comparables, uh, which says that, no, my building's not worth anything like that anymore. It's worth a million or even lower. And so with things like the WeWork bankruptcy and the, the you know FDIC trying to get rid of these assets, we're going to start getting price discovery in commercial real estate. Uh, in the Substack, I also kind of share uh, the top five commercial real estate losses, uh, courtesy of Rudy Havenstein's Substack. And guess what? <laughs> None of them are actually office. It's retail and mall. And so, you know, the bloodbath has not even started. And, and, and that is, you know, we've been talking about this for some time, but guys, we've got a long way to go. Um, okay, so... Uh, it's a crazy time. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of people screaming. I hope you stop here because I'm, I'm not going to be screaming. I, I might get a little passionate and that definitely happens, but I'm here to just relay the facts to you. And if there are facts that I don't have, then I want them. I want you to tell me about them, you know, kindly if possible, uh, you know, because I really am trying to get to the truth. I'm not trying to sell anything on this channel. Um, so, you know, please reach out to me if I'm missing something, et cetera, let me know. Cause I'm all about trying to have the conversation. In the meantime, if you have a decision to make um, and, and you need, you, you know, you wanna reach out and you have some questions, you know, you can at me on Twitter. You can um, reach me here, leave a comment. I'm behind in comments, but I'm flying today hoping to get caught up on those comments, <laughs> um, but leave me a comment. If I don't respond right away, I promise you, I will do my, I will, I will read it. And if I don't respond, it may be because some, you, you never know. Uh, sometimes the comments get deleted. Don't assume that I, I don't want to respond. Um, assume that I missed it and try again. Um, so hoping to get caught up on my YouTube comments today, um, but you can reach me in, you know, comments in my Substack. M3 Melody Substack on Twitter. I'm in M3 underscore Melody, M E L O D Y, um, here on YouTube, and then LinkedIn Melody Wright, W R I G H T. So, guys, I hope you have a great week. Wish me luck um, on my, this trek out to Denver. This is always a fun flight, just kidding, from uh, the East Coast because it's always longer than you think it should be. Uh, but looking forward to get out there, looking at new build sites, talking to people. And just thanks again to everybody for watching. I really appreciate it. And, and thanks for your patience with my low quality. Um, uh, but, you know, the, the information is the most important thing right now. Thanks again. Have a great day. Talk to you soon. Bye.